a state of war once more exists between Great Britain and Germany. Today is victory in Europe day. While the German war machine seemed unstoppable for most of the Second World War, its unflinching advance met setbacks in Russia and North Africa, followed by defeats in their territory in Europe, leading to their ultimate defeat in May of 1945. However, when Nazi Germany fell, the tons of weaponry seized by the victorious Western allies and the Soviets had to be dealt with. Today, there's a whole market for Nazi memorabilia, and then there are museum collections. But back in the day, the Nazi war machine was capable of leveling cities. So, what really happened to all those captured German weapons after the war? Let's find out. The war that changed the world forever. After the Second World War ended, German weapons weren't just left behind. They were dealt with in different ways. However, before we dive deeper into how countries dealt with the aftermath of such a massive conflict, let's take a look at the war at the heart of it. Germany's involvement in the Second World War started with its invasion of Poland in September 1939. This triggered a cascade of events that plunged the world into conflict. Employing blitzkrieg tactics, German forces swiftly overran Poland. In response, Britain and France, two rival continental powers, declared war on the Nazi war machine. The next year, German territory expanded significantly in Western Europe. From Denmark and Norway in April to the conquest of the Low Countries and France by mid-year, Germany's military machine seemed unstoppable. They even established the Vichy government in the region to solidify their control. The 1940-1941 period of the war saw Germany embroiled in the Battle of Britain and the Balkans campaign. The aerial onslaught against Britain, known as the Battle of Britain, however, failed miserably when the Royal Air Force outperformed the feared German Luftwaffe. However, Germany was able to expand its influence in southeastern Europe with the occupation of Yugoslavia and Greece. But the most pivotal moment in the war came with Operation Barbarossa, which launched in June 1941 to conquer the Soviet Union, their then ally. Despite initial successes, the campaign proved to be a costly endeavor, both in terms of resources and manpower. The harsh Soviet winter and staunch resistance began to take its toll on the German war machine. The tide of war shifted dramatically from 1942 to 1943 with significant setbacks for Germany. The Battle of Stalingrad resulted in a decisive Soviet victory. This was a turning point in the war. Meanwhile, Western Allied forces made gains in North Africa, culminating in the surrender of Axis forces in Tunisia. As the war progressed to 1944, Germany found itself fighting on two fronts. In the east, Soviet forces pushed steadily westward, reclaiming territory lost earlier in the conflict. In the west, Allied forces landed in Italy and began their advance towards Germany. The Allied invasion of Normandy on D-Day established a crucial beachhead in France while Germany's last major offensive in the Ardennes, known as the Battle of the Bulge, ultimately failed to halt the Allied advance. The next year, Soviet forces launched a final assault on Berlin, leading to the fall of the Nazi regime and Hitler's suicide in his bunker. With the unconditional surrender of Germany on May 7, 1945, the Second World War in Europe came to a close. But of course, the question of the Nazi war machine, or more specifically, its hardware, lingered. Even during the war, the Western Allies and Soviets did use captured German weapons against the Nazi forces. But now that the war was over, dealing with the catches of munitions, guns, planes, tanks, and other military assets became a major concern. Using captured German weapons against the Nazi war machine. During the war, Frontline soldiers, facing shortages in their supplies, often used captured weapons and equipment against the Nazi war machine. This was especially true for tanks and armored fighting vehicles, or AFVs. 
This went both ways, of course. Both the Allied and Axis powers resorted to using enemy armor to bolster their forces. For the German Wehrmacht, incorporating captured vehicles into their ranks was a systematic and deliberate strategy. They even seized vehicles from occupied territories like Austria and Czechoslovakia before the war began. As they conquered France, the Low Countries, and large parts of the Soviet Union, they integrated the captured tanks and AFVs into their units. This helped fill significant gaps in their order of battle, particularly during the early stages of the war. In contrast, the Western Allies had less need for captured German tanks and Axis vehicles. Allied production capacity was much higher, allowing them to replace losses and equip new units without relying on captured enemy equipment. Plus, incorporating foreign spare parts and ammunition types into their supply pipelines would have complicated logistical matters. Since German factories remained out of Allied hands until the war's end, adopting captured German vehicles was not practical. That is not to say that there were no exceptions to this trend. However, after the war, the Allied forces embarked on a significant operation to seize and control the extensive German military arsenal. This was necessary for preventing the proliferation of the said weapons and to ensure stability in post-war Europe, especially Germany, where the Nazi sentiment had not completely died out even after the defeat. The Western Allies implemented a meticulous cataloging process to inventory and document the vast array of captured German weapons. The Allies thus tracked weapon types and quantities, facilitated distribution where necessary, and prevented illicit arms trafficking. Of course, the victorious Allied authorities also had to navigate complex agreements regarding the handling and disposition of wartime assets. Additionally, administrative challenges arose in managing the logistical aspects of storing, transporting, and securing the captured weapons. They also had to account for factors such as military capability, strategic priorities, and diplomatic agreements. But generally, the idea was to allocate weapons based on each nation's needs and contributions to the war effort. However, even this was not without its challenges. The mistrust between the Western Allies and the Soviets, who had just defeated a common enemy, grossly complicated matters. Even as this chapter of conflict came to an end, another one, the Cold War, was about to start. Naturally, both emerging superpowers sought to bolster their military capabilities and extend their influence in post-war Europe. Both sides claimed their share of the spoils both during and after the war. Germany itself, as with the rest of Europe, had been divided into two. The situation was best described by British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill, who claimed that an iron curtain had descended over Europe. Spoils of War for the Soviet Union The Soviet Union emerged as the largest user of captured German armor. With a desperate need for any equipment to resist the Nazi invaders, small units, and companies of captured enemy tanks were organized. Soviet Army orders specified using captured tanks as long as they remain at operational. Soviet troops made extensive use of captured German equipment to supplement their resources. This included items like boots, knives, mess kits, flashlights, and even personal items such as shavers and sidearms. Similarly, German troops often sought Soviet winter boots and hats. There was even an exchange of submachine guns with German troops using Soviet PPSH-41s and Red Army troops using captured German MP-40s. After the Battle of Stalingrad in 1943, several hundred German Panzer III tanks and Stuji III assault guns were captured by Soviet forces. These vehicles were salvaged and refurbished, with over 100 being rebuilt as the Su-76I self-propelled guns. German Panzer I-based command vehicles were fitted with Soviet 20mm Schwack cannons. Additionally, ex-German Panzer IV medium tanks and Panther tanks were also put to use by the Soviets. Although Tiger I and II tanks 
were mainly used for testing. Larger German tanks like the Panthers were prized for their fighting qualities and often kept in service beyond their expected lifespan. Maintaining captured tanks in the field presented logistical challenges, including the supply of spare parts and ammunition. The vast distances on the Eastern Front made transportation of captured stocks to units in need a daunting task. Coordination with friendly units and aircraft was essential to minimize friendly fire incidents. To do so, the troops often put up visible Soviet identification markings on the tanks. Captured equipment also provided valuable intelligence on enemy capabilities and weaknesses. Soviet units used Axis tanks in deception operations to approach German positions under the guise of friendly forces and then unleashed hell. The Soviets fielded a variety of Axis vehicles and aircraft throughout the war, ranging from tanks like the Panzer IV to aircraft such as the Messerschmitt BF-109 and Junkers Ju-87. For context, this was all happening at a time when the Soviets had been taken by surprise by the German onslaught and were ill-prepared to fight back, especially when it came to firepower. This pragmatic approach helped them maximize their military resources during the conflict and eventually push the Germans out. Spoils of war for the Western Allies and resistance fighters in Europe. This trend of fielding captured weapons against the Nazis was also true for the Western Allies, even if the extent of it was not as much. One notable instance occurred in North Africa, where the British Army faced shortages of its modern tanks. In March 1941, the British reported having 365 available tanks, with approximately 60 tanks, being Italian medium models captured at Beta Foam. These Italian tanks, although overhauled and fitted with British radios, were not well regarded by British tank crews due to their thin armor and poor mechanical reliability. The 6th Royal Tank Regiment arrived at Tobruk in February 1941 without its tanks. It was ordered to take over the Italian M1340 medium tanks at Beta Foam. Equipped with these Italian tanks by March 12th, the regiment faced numerous challenges, such as overheating and power loss. By the end of March, only 36 of the M1340s remained operational, and by April, the majority of these tanks were purposefully destroyed by the British themselves. The use of captured enemy tanks provided a crucial supplement to Allied forces, allowing them to continue their operations and resist enemy advances. Amidst the chaos of the war, units often seized opportunities to employ captured enemy tanks for tactical advantage. These instances, however, are uncounted and largely undocumented. Captured tanks were used until they broke down or ran out of ammunition, after which they were destroyed to prevent recapture. A small number underwent inspection and evaluation by intelligence units before being shipped back to England or the United States for technical testing or display in museums. However, not all captured vehicles were preserved. Many captured German tanks at the Aberdeen Proving Ground, for instance, met their demise in a scrap metal drive during the Korean War. The perceived superiority of German tanks made them highly desirable for troops seeking to augment their equipment. German half-tracks were also repurposed by all Allied armies, often retrofitted with machine guns for easier ammunition resupply. One well-documented case involved the Canadian Seaforth Highlanders, capturing an intact panther on the Italian front in October 1944. Renamed Deserter and assigned to the 145th Royal Armored Corps, the tank participated in mobility tests against Sherman and Churchill tanks. Another notable example was the panther tank named Cuckoo, found abandoned during the fighting for the village of Overloon. Adopted by the 4th Battalion Coldstream Guards, Cuckoo impressed its new owners with its superior optics and combat capabilities. Resistance fighters, in rare instances, also fielded captured tanks against the Axis troops. During the Warsaw Uprising in 1944, Polish Home Army fighters seized German equipment, including tanks, 
to bolster their defense against Nazi forces. This exemplifies the adaptability and determination of soldiers and resistance fighters to accomplish their missions under challenging circumstances. The Wonder Weapons The so-called German Wonder Weapons during the Second World War have often been steeped in myth and speculation. Many attribute the delayed deployment of these advanced German technologies to a potential turning point in the outcome of the war. However, the impact and effectiveness of these weapons could have done little to save a surrounded Nazi territory. In any case, the research value of these weapons interested the victors who seized them before they could be fielded against their troops. These innovative weapons included rocket fighters, jet fighters, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles. Back in the day, these advancements sparked concern among the Allies, who recognized the potential strategic implications of these new technologies. Despite their technological innovation, many of the German wonder weapons faced significant technical limitations and challenges in combat deployment. After all, Nazi Germany was losing and research funds were drying out. The Messerschmitt Mi-163 rocket interceptor and the Mi-262 turbojet aircraft perfectly exemplify this problem. Both of these struggled with reliability issues and were vulnerable to Allied countermeasures. The V-1 cruise missile and V-2 ballistic missile, while technologically advanced for their time, lacked accurate guidance systems and failed to deliver the anticipated strategic impact. Allied forces quickly adapted their air defense strategies to intercept and neutralize these missile attacks. Overall, Allied superiority in terms of manpower, resources, and industrial capacity had all but sealed the course of the war, outweighing any potential advantages of such advanced weaponry. Propaganda played a significant role in shaping public perception of German wonder weapons and their potential impact on the war. Exaggerated claims of technological superiority by Nazi propagandists contributed to the mythologization of these weapons, obscuring their actual effectiveness in combat. However, there was one exception. Nazi Germany had ambitions to develop an atomic bomb. They initiated a program known as the Uranium Club to research nuclear weapons. However, Due to resource limitations, scientific challenges, and the progression of the war, they were unable to achieve their goal before Germany's defeat in 1945. On the side of the Allies, there were concerns about the Nazi atomic bomb project, which propelled them to double up their efforts and achieve a quick victory against the Nazis. Also, the Americans were making significant strides in their own nuclear research efforts through the Manhattan Project. One can only wonder what would have been if Germany had beat the USA to the punch with a nuke. But after the war, Germany was stripped of all firepower and occupied by the conquering powers who split it into West and East, rebuilding West Germany's defenses the aftermath of the war saw significant shifts in Allied policies towards Germany, particularly regarding disarmament and rearmament efforts. Initially, the 1945 Morgenthau Plan aimed to reduce Allied-occupied Germany to a pre-industrial state by dismantling its arms and key industries. The UK and the US vigorously pursued disarmament in Germany during the first three years of occupation. However, this policy became increasingly unpopular and clashed with the goals of the 1948 Marshall Plan, which aimed to foster industrial growth. Through the Marshall Plan, financial aid flowed into West Germany, facilitating infrastructure reconstruction, industrial revitalization, and societal recovery. These endeavors, coupled with the introduction of democratic institutions, paved the way for West Germany's emergence as an economic powerhouse in post-war Europe. Amidst the backdrop of Cold War tensions, East-West divisions became starkly evident with the construction of the Berlin Wall in 1961. The wall exacerbated tensions between the Communist East and the Democratic West, and over the years, it became a symbol of oppression. Nonetheless, 
The desire for freedom fueled protests and escape attempts. Ultimately, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 marked a historic turning point, symbolizing the end of Soviet dominance in Eastern Europe and paving the way for Germany's reunification in 1990, restoring the nation's sovereignty. But post-World War II, neither East nor West Germany had regular armed forces. However, this changed with the detonation of the RDS-1 atomic bomb by the Soviet Union in 1949 and the outbreak of the Korean War in 1950. The rise of communism prompted a reassessment of Western Europe's defense needs. West German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer sought to regain sovereignty for West Germany. Despite initial skepticism, West Germany's desire to join NATO and its willingness to cooperate ultimately gained support. In 1955, West Germany joined NATO, marking a significant step in its reintegration into the international defense community. The Bundeswehr, or the West German military, was also rearmed and manned for the defense of Europe through funds from the U.S. military assistance program. Former Kriegsmarine ships seized under the Tripartite Naval Commission were returned by the U.S. West German sailors received intensive training and were stationed on United States Navy ships. This collaboration aimed to establish an effective naval force for West Germany. While Chancellor Konrad Adenauer's budget initially called for limited air power, the U.S. Air Force leaders advocated for a larger Luftwaffe along American lines. This led to the establishment of a small air force focused on supporting ground operations. West Germany aimed to have up to 500,000 men in military service, surpassing Italy's military strength. The transformation of the Bundesgrenzschutz, or the Federal Border Guard, into military personnel and the institution of conscription were part of efforts to achieve this goal. While some feared a resurgence of German militarism and its potential political implications, Many former German officers believed that no future German army could exist without rehabilitating the Wehrmacht. They presented demands, including the release of convicted war criminals and an end to the defamation of German soldiers, which were accepted by Adenauer. Adolf Husinger and Hans Spadel were sworn into the newly founded Bundeswehr on November 12, 1955, marking the establishment of the West German Navy known as the Bundesmarine. Adenauer also established the Blank Office, or Amt Blank, to leverage West German defense contributions for increased sovereignty. France, initially opposed the naval rearmament of West Germany, buckled under the pressure from Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe. Despite rearmament, the West German military remained under Supreme Allied NATO control, limiting its command positions. The growth of the Bundeswehr, alongside the 1951 Treaty of Paris, solidified Western European economic cooperation and integrated post-war West Germany into the European community. However, the Soviet Union used this as a justification for implementing the Warsaw Pact, exerting military and political control over Eastern European states. Global Impact of Captured German Weapons a significant portion of Nazi military equipment, including tanks, small arms, and missiles, were subjected to testing and analysis by Allied powers. This allowed them to gain insights into German technological advancements and combat tactics. However, the vast majority of German equipment was scrapped for metal. The scale of scrapping was staggering, with thousands of aircraft alone being scrapped between 1945 and 1946 at locations like Kingman Air Force Base in Arizona. The Soviet Union retained much of the weaponry as trophies. Fields and forests across the former USSR still bear witness to the rusting remains of the Second World War weapons. Despite some items being damaged in battle, others were simply abandoned and forgotten. France, faced with the need to quickly rebuild its military infrastructure, equipped a tank regiment with captured German Panther tanks until 1949, when they were replaced by the ARL-44 heavy tank. Similarly, the Lebanese acquired SM-79 bombers from Italy, 
but due to poor maintenance and aging, these aircraft quickly fell into disrepair. Surprisingly, German Panzer IV tanks and Stu G3 assault guns continued to see action in the 1967 Six-Day War, employed by various Arab nations. Similarly, Israel, during its formative years, relied on a significant number of German weapons, including knockoff BF-109 aircraft. A thriving black market trade also emerged after the war, with surplus weaponry finding its way to minor nations eager to bolster their military capabilities. German small arms, renowned for their precision engineering, initially proliferated across the globe due to post-war availability. However, the rapid advancement of U.S. military technology, influenced in part by captured German engineers and scientists, soon surpassed many German designs. The V-1 Loon, reverse-engineered by the USA, exemplifies this shift. Despite the perception of German military superiority, by early 1945, Allied technological advancements were gaining momentum. A significant portion of leftover German armor ended up in the hands of collectors and museums, where they were showcased in exhibitions and sometimes restored for personal use. Despite these efforts, many German tanks were reduced to scrap metal. A shortage of spare parts and the introduction of more advanced British, American and Soviet tanks into the market rendered the German tanks increasingly obsolete over time. Preservation and Ethical Considerations Museums play a crucial role in preserving history and educating the public about the events of the Second World War. By curating exhibitions and preserving artifacts, museums provide valuable insights into the complexities of wartime experiences. Through interactive displays and educational programs, they offer visitors a deeper understanding of the historical context. Private collectors have also preserved wartime artifacts, ensuring that they are not lost to time. Their efforts often complement those of museums, providing additional avenues for research and public engagement with history. However, the collection and display of German war weapons raise ethical concerns that must be carefully considered. These artifacts are not merely historical objects, but symbols of a dark chapter in human history. Displaying them without proper context or sensitivity can glorify violence and perpetuate harmful ideologies. In recent years, there has been a notable increase in the market for buying and selling Nazi memorabilia, driven in part by the passing of veterans and subsequent attempts by families to divest themselves of such possessions. However, this trend has sparked controversy and condemnation among many in the general public, who find the commercial trading of Nazi antiques tasteless and hateful. Individuals and businesses selling such items have faced criticism for profiting from symbols associated with one of history's darkest periods. While some collectors are solely interested in the historical background and design of Nazi artifacts, others are known supporters of neo-Nazism and hate groups. This has led to debates about the ethical implications of trading in Nazi memorabilia. Jewish groups, in particular, have expressed disapproval of the sale and purchase of such items for leisure purposes, citing concerns about glorifying or trivializing the atrocities committed during the Holocaust, which was a systematic persecution and genocide of six million Jews by the Nazi regime during World War II, along with the Romani people, Poles, disabled individuals, and others deemed undesirable by the Nazis. Some Jewish figures believe that certain Nazi memorabilia hold historical significance and should be preserved to ensure that the lessons of the Holocaust are not forgotten. Legal restrictions on the sale of Nazi memorabilia vary by country. In some parts of Europe, such as France, the sale of such items is strictly prohibited. Auction websites like eBay have implemented guidelines to prohibit the sale of certain items associated with Nazi propaganda or symbols, aiming to prevent the glorification of war crimes and crimes against humanity. 
Despite these efforts, the market for Nazi memorabilia continues to raise ethical and legal challenges. Moreover, there are ethical considerations regarding the provenance of these artifacts. It is essential to ensure that items in museum collections or private collections were obtained ethically and legally, without contributing to the glorification of war or the exploitation of human suffering. Transparent documentation of the origins and histories of these artifacts is crucial to maintaining ethical standards in the preservation and display of German war weapons. In any case, the capture of German weapons alongside the devastation wrought by the Second World War profoundly influenced post-war geopolitics and military technology. It accelerated the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union, leading to advancements in missile technology, jet propulsion, and other fields. Moreover, the Nazi Wonder Weapons program, though ultimately unsuccessful in altering the outcome of the war, spurred scientific innovation and contributed to the development of modern rocketry and aerospace engineering. Today, these remnants teach us about the horrors of the war and hatred that killed millions. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Don't miss this video you see on your screen right now. It's truly unbelievable.